Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur, Madame, bonjour, bienvenue. Welcome to our session this morning in such an illustrious round. And I do deeply apologize, and I'm very embarrassed that I'm the last one to arrive, <laughs> although I was supposed to be here as a moderator first. But um, we were in the French Senate this morning, which is also a very special experience. I'm in a fantastic building in which parliamentarians were talking about something that we will address in a moment here, which is in the context of our landscape forum to address the issue of fiscal policy of legislative environments that ultimately determine land use decisions. You have from Uganda to Mexico to, well, Brazil in one aspect and the world at large um, and Pavan also an extraordinary panel. I think you will have a fantastic discussion this morning. My plea from the organizers to convey to you was less theory, more illustration, and practices and lessons learned, because this is, in a sense, an informed audience. We are really trying to get to the core of what is it that the legislative, the policy environment can achieve in order to make land use come closer to where we are. We all know that agriculture is a very significant part of the agenda in the climate change context, but not only. It is, in fact, about the natural wealth of nations, about functioning ecosystems, about whether agriculture is only about food production or whether it is more about food security, whether it is about issues of equity, because land is very often the frontier in our societies where equity and inequity have some of their most brutal encounters. Let us not forget that. And it is also about whether land use is um, for a greater national economic good, such as forest ecosystems, or for a more specific national economic good, export of agricultural commodities, the frontier of land use. So you have a fantastic panel. I will not take any more time to introduce them. You have them in the program. They are some of the great minds in our community, and we would like to begin by inviting Pavan Sukdev to give us an introductory address on uh, some of what you have found in this area. Pavan, welcome. Thank you. for that kind introduction and very useful uh, pointer towards the area that we are exploring. Uh, Your Excellencies, delighted to be here with you on this very distinguished panel, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Friends, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the topic today of uh, agricultural fiscal policies, what they mean, why they're significant, uh, what they mean particularly in our context as in the context of landscapes, and uh, with an eye towards how big they are, their impacts, and what we can perhaps do to change them. I think the first, the first point I, I want to bring is, uh, doesn't need any slides as such, is, is to do with the sheer size of the scale and extent of engagement that governments have in agriculture in terms of financing agriculture. We've all heard of the, the overall size of subsidies. I think the work that the IMF put out earlier this year was, uh, pathbreaking in the sense that they looked at it from the perspective not merely of the production subsidies for fossil fuels that are of the order of half a, bi half a trillion dollars, $500 billion, not merely of the price subsidies in certain OECD countries, but against a benchmark of what should be the right level. In other words, they accounted for, as they call it, on an after-tax basis. In other words, they did not assume that um, uh, there was a, a baseline which could be just ignored. They were, they were always focused on the right baseline. Um, their conclusion, if I quote them, is that uh, consumer prices are below supply costs plus a tax to reflect environmental damage and an additional tax applied to all consumption goods to raise government revenues. In that, on that post-tax basis, energy subsidies are dramatically higher than previously estimated. And the earlier estimates that we were all talking about, including my colleagues and I with the United Nations Environment Programs, report on the green economy in 2011, or of the order of several hundreds of billions. But now, if we look at it from this perspective of on a post-tax basis, what does this mean in terms of the support being de facto provided? The answer, uh, friends, is much bigger. So here we are talking about 4.9 trillion estimate in 2013. And uh, this year, 2015, an estimate of 5.3 trillion US dollars. That's 5.3 million million US dollars of overall energy subsidies. What could happen? And this is where we need to strategize, but also to dream. Because what could happen if we did not live with the world that we have grown over, over these last few decades 
is quite remarkable because in a post uh, tax based subsidy calculation in a world where these would not be there among the results of that according to the IMF's report would be that government revenues could be increased by 2.9 trillion in other words something like 3.6 percent of global GDP this is staggeringly huge and this is something that we need to seriously bring center stage in our thinking because frankly today we are still not out of the woods as you can see the markets reflect first one view then another interest rates the Fed amongst others reflects one view than the other. We are still not out of the woods post the recession of 2008. And governments, G20 governments today need to rethink how they're going to strategize their own funding. They need to recognize that it is no longer possible to imagine an expanding tax pie. Corporate profits are not increasing. Salaries are not increasing, especially post recession. You don't get higher paid jobs. So to assume that there will be a higher pie at which to apply the same rates is not realistic. And conversely, to assume that you can somehow jack up the rates of taxation is not politically appropriate. So we have to look at different ways of financing ourselves. And I think that's where the work of the IMF is to be applauded, because it opens a window on from where governments can get, especially the G20 governments, can get additional financing. The size and scale of agricultural subsidies is smaller, thank God, compared to this. But here we are talking about still, according to one estimate that was made in 2014 by the World Watch Institute, we are still talking about $486 billion, which is huge. And it is interesting to see, unlike the general world of energy, how significant these subsidies are as a fraction of gross value added, or GDP, within the agricultural sector. So if we look at some of the highest uh, uh, agricultural GDPs, uh, we are talking about China with 950 billion, European Union with 280, United States with 251, and so on. And if we look at the top five uh, countries, then we find that, in fact, the agricultural subsidies being provided, in other words, the financing by their governments, is of the order of 36%, 34%, almost 50%, and so on. So these are very significant fractions of the GVA in these particular sectors. And that's why we need to rethink what is going on. I'm from India, and, and we have the same problem here, where through history, agricultural subsidies have been high. Uh, during the period from 2004, 5 to 2008, 9, while agricultural GDP grew uh, by 70%, from 100 billion plus 108 billion to 160 billion, our subsidies grew at almost double the pace. In other words, more than 140%. So this is something that I think I've personally lived with and, and struggled with for some time. What do these subsidies do? It is not merely that it is sometimes directed towards government spending in the areas which promote exactly some of the challenges that we face in our times. In other words, the promotion of investment in further uh, pesticides and fertilizers and chemical-based uh, pesticides and fertilizers as against the promotion of alternative technologies and especially small farm technologies. Very often, they tend to finance and therefore exacerbate the problems that we have created as a, as a result of not sizing or, cog or being uh, able to absorb and understand the extent to which the invisible impacts of all these flows are affecting our society and our economies. Um, the United Nations Environment Program published a report on uh, red plus and fiscal policies and pointed out uh, several uh, of the points that I will touch upon today. But two, one general and one specific I would like to highlight is that firstly the idea that we could think of fiscal policy and subsidies and, and, and taxes as ways to solve significant challenges. We said that the public policy and related fiscal policy and incentives must seek coherence across sectors in order to be able to overcome the conflicts between sectors and competing land uses and to send the right signals. And specifically, we've highlighted one area which people do not necessarily associate with subsidies, which is inequity. In other words, to quote, the inequity in agricultural subsidies is well debated in many countries with concern that the largest and wealthiest producers typically reap the bulk of the benefits, while small producers tend to lose out. So, friends, we have a typically significant and entrenched issue with sustainable development to do with fiscal management, to do with the poverty 
uh, of, of the lowest of the, bo of the bottom of the economic pyramid and to do with inequity in the manner in which uh, fiscal resources are being spent. And certainly if any of you as taxpayers uh, or anyone else as a taxpayer were to be asked, what do you think your government spends your money on? The obvious answer would not necessarily be subsidies. You would think of more in terms of health, education, and so on. But sadly, the answer is actually energy subsidies and at a lower scale, agri-subsidies. Now, some of these are overlapping because if we look at agri-subsidies, we do find elements of energy. We do find elements of, of direct uh, price support. And these are some of the challenges that we have to deal with as we investigate the area. The challenge is uh, deep because it is also cross-connected. So some of the work that my colleagues from the TEAB team, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, and myself have been uh, doing for some time now, uh, which will be announced later on, is illustrated by this framework, what we call a valuation framework, of the externalities and the value chain boundaries of the whole chain of the whole agricultural uh, system, what we call um, the eco-agri-food systems complex, recognizing that the production of, of food, the agricultural side, takes huge inputs from ecosystems, uh, makes use of both natural as well as physical infrastructure in terms of energy utilities and water utilities, produces at small and large farms, makes use of manufactured inputs, and we do calculate the value added of all those components, but then we move from that part, the, processing, uh, the, the production part of the value chain to the processing part, and there we have an equally complex arena where the entire wholesale market, the food and beverage industry, and the retail sector are involved. And then finally on the consumption part where we are involved as consumers and where the role of uh, everything from hotels to restaurants to homes in the way they buy, process, and waste food is quite significant. As Many of you know a third of all food that is grown is actually wasted at one point or the other. One of the key points of waste is unfortunately still the household. When we look at where subsidies could be better applied and where fiscal policy therefore could be better targeted, we find that we need to truly move away from our somewhat simplistic common person on the ground understanding of agriculture and food systems as essentially just a farm system which ends up with uh, benefits in terms of uh, food and fuel and fiber, and maybe a little bit of uh, cultural benefits from the system, to recognize it in its totality, not just the visibles, but the invisibles, to recognize the flows that come to food from ecosystems, to recognize the positive benefits, which are mainly invisibles, in terms of some of the many that are listed in the blue empty boxes at the bottom of this diagram, all the way from soil and nutrients, right across to pest control and, and uh, decomposition of waste and so on. And then recognize not just the technical and, and other inputs, including labor, which is a key factor that we need to build into our assessments, but also some of the pollution impacts and the health impacts of agriculture. And when we see the totality of the system, not just as uh, uh, rather than a food production, then we realize the next step, which is that the flexibility we have in applying fiscal policy and imply, uh, applying other policies as well stretches across many parts of the value chain. So we could have entry points, policy entry points such as here, which is going directly to the output and being able to manipulate prices. We could have policy entry points that are applying to the inputs and therefore appropriately support or not support different inputs based on how they add value to the system. Or we could have policy entry points applying to the health externalities, which can be quite significant in certain forms of agriculture and use of pesticides. Uh, we could apply entry policy entry points in terms of pollution coming from, uh, from agriculture, or for that matter, in terms of greenhouse gases, which is the topic of this, of this COP. So we have a wide range of entry points. We have a wide range of options. We have toolkit and flexibility. I think we need to pull this thing together into a vision of how we move forward so that food and agriculture no longer becomes a generator of what we in economics call negative externalities, which are largely hidden, but actually a huge generator of positive externalities, which provides us not just the nutrition, not just the livelihood of more than a billion small farmers, but also the cultural values of food, the fact that it is the binding culture that actually keeps us and makes us realize that we are humans. Thank you.
Pavan, thank you very much as usual in trying to give us um, a systemic perspective. I think much of the theme of this morning's discussion will focus on trying to address things that we measure and identify through a scientific and, let's say, environmental perspective, increasingly in the policy arena where decisions that are traditionally beyond that, as you illustrated just now, the agricultural system, actually determine what happens. And I would like to turn to um, President uh, Calderon, who also is the chairman of the new Climate Economy Commission, who has over the last few months spoken time and again on that more systemic perspective. And if I may start with perhaps both asking you to reflect for a moment on the experience, because I remember we met fairly early in your presidency when you had just sent back a cabinet proposal on the emissions pathway for Mexico and saying this is just not good enough, go back to the drawing board. So that notion of how something that you measure in a very particular context is linked to so many other areas in your economy or around the cabinet, around different portfolios, I think would be very interesting to understand a little bit how that fiscal broader policy agenda that a president can almost, in theory, dictate at the beginning of his or her tenure then becomes subject to so many different forces. And secondly, perhaps to then speak a little bit more specific to the notion of land use, both, again, in Mexico, very particular experiences you had, but also in the context of the new climate economy and some of the research that you have recently published. So welcome, uh, President Calderon, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. First, I, I want to congratulate uh, the great presentation we, we, have, we have seen a few minutes ago. It's incredible powerful, clear. I got very confused with all those lines and arrows, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, um, coming back to that, well, the experience is uh, like this. When we started to design a program and a policy in order to measure and reduce our carbon print and try to design some kind of unilateral voluntary commitment coming from a developing country to reduce by first time ever, our carbon emission, at least from business as usual. So the first draft I received in my office was the traditional one, one which is, was elaborated for the environmental secretary, uh, more related with the environmental people. But honestly, the rest of the government was not committed at all to reduce those policies, and actually, we had in place, even I need to recognize during several couple of years at least at the beginning, uh, programs and subsidies that were completely in the opposite direction. For instance, programs uh, subsidizing or promoting cattle, and uh, even in the forest regions and, and surface which were competing exactly against our purposes in order to stop deforestation and even to put in place a quite aggressive program related with uh, afforestation or reforestation in Mexico. So we need to, I need to call uh, for a cabinet session to put clear the rules of the government to establish clearly where, where, uh, where were our priorities at that time, what are those priorities were, of course, over any other priority in the members of the cabinet. So for instance, people in the agricultural department, agricultural secretary, resisted a lot. They did at the beginning of their job. They canceled some of the programs and so on. But coming uh, the years, and going back to work, they were facing the opposition in Congress. And uh, I agree completely with that. In Mexico, there are like 500, not, uh, are, they are 500 congressmen, congresswomen, uh, probably, 125 are uh, big farmers. Uh, actually, in the political traditional system in Mexico, one of the three sectors is the, the peasants or the farmer sectors. In the traditional big party, a very authoritarian one at the time. And of course, they can decide the budget according with their own priorities. And as you were saying, probably 80% of the money in subsidies for agricultural sector w went exactly to them, you know, in an incredible unfair way. And of course, this block was the most important obstacle to address the whole government 
in the right direction. So we need to impose our own criteria in our own government, but politics in the field you know, are exactly one of the issues we need to, to overcome. Finally, we got a program, we started to reduce our carbon emissions, we changed some of the programs, not all of them, because they were decided in Congress and we had not majority then. But that could be my, my experience. So lessons is you need to have clear, clearly, you, you need to establish your own priorities and you need to impose, if I can say that, at least your own government and field, those priorities and to make clear your point. Second is a question related with uh, like, a, like a crossing view, it's across the board, the government. You, you should not allow to get captured in the idea the environmental issues are only for the environmental areas in the government. It's a, a very common mistake. Uh, you, can ha you can have a lot of people very committed there, working a lot, and everybody else doing exactly the contrary, in particular the agricultural sector, the oil industry, for instance, and others. So you need to be strong, uh, establishing across the board policies and, and pushing finally with the right political and economic incentives. For instance, Pro Arbol was a program more oriented towards payment of environmental services, so, so we changed some of the old subsidies to the agricultural purposes for cattle, for instance, to pay for, to the indigenous communities to preserve, maintain, and even reforest their own communities and forests and rainforests and, and woods and so on. Uh, uh, actually, we started to pay these environmental services according with the importance of the basin of those areas and so on. And with that, we were able to start a new kind of policy related with land uses in Mexico. Of course, much more must to be done, and we didn't complete the task, but that's basically my comments. Can I just ask one question? When you have breakthroughs in the policy arena, is it because you essentially outmaneuver those 125 or those particular interests, or because they begin to recognize that they may gain something from it as well, or maybe both. But um, is it always a matter of having to beat one interest in order to enable another one to come, or is the agenda beginning to offer the proverbial win-wins also? Well, basically, to be honest, at that time, uh, it was a battle for who was going to to have the support of public opinion. Mm -hmm. And we started to push a lot in order to environment, environmental issues. Uh, we started to get a lot of support in political terms coming precisely, curiously, from indigenous communities, for instance. Um, of course, I have the support of my own government and people working in, in all those programs. The other vision, the win-win situation, which it's, it is something that actually is relatively new for a lot of us, and the main focus of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate is exactly that. So by two years, we have worked with an incredible group of people coming from the business sector or the international financial institutions, former leaders of, of uh, state of government, in order to find the way, you know, the, the secret uh, recipe in order to get the economic growth and social benefits and poverty alleviation and at the same time tackle climate change. And of course there are a lot of win-win situations. In, for instance, in forestry, I wonder if uh, we are not doing exactly right the, the maths related with forestry, for instance. No? It is incredible that countries like of Finland, Norway, Sweden, Chile, in Latin America, Costa Rica, they are increasing their surface of forest, for instance, with a very productive industry related with, with woods and uh, uh, with forestry. And we are unable to do so, and we are unable to, to establish clear programs that could, uh, blow, could, could, could push really hard, like a serious, uh, responsible uh, forest industry in Mexico and other countries, and it, it, it has an incredible potential. And other, but, but I need to say uh, uh, that uh, we need to recognize at the same time that any change implies winners and losers. If you are unable to manage the interests of the losers and to provide to them some kind of fair transition, you will face an incredible resistance and, of course, a lot of vested interests trying to blow up all the programs. So that is politics about it. Uh, but of course, it's public policy as well. How can you make a little bit smoothy the transition from all those people or sectors that could lose 
in a very responsible policy and providing to them new opportunities in the field. Thank you, and I think we will, um, I will now turn to um, Maria Kivanuk in a moment, but we'll return to that theme also, I think very much maybe through your experience, Braulio, and in Brazil's perspective of the forest code, which was very much about everybody thought they were gonna be losers except those who thought they were winners. And now the implementation is turning out to be a very different story, which is often, I think, one of the mistakes of environmental policy reforms that it does not articulate an agenda for the losers in terms of being part of that transition. Maria, if I may turn to you for a moment. Former finance minister, now a special advisor to the president, but if I can stay on the theme for a moment of the macro policy and the fiscal policy. I mean, you sat in the chair of finance minister where every portfolio wants its money and you have to essentially look at the economic growth path and development path of a country. Are there instances where you saw in the way that <coughs> either the Minister of Environment or of Energy or of Agriculture could have actually articulated a way that allows fiscal policy in the sense of decarbonization or greater sustainability to have not been seen only as a cost to the economy but actually as a, as a win? Or what would you have done differently at the end of your tenure than at the beginning in getting ministries or sectors to make their case differently, particularly with a view also to land use, obviously, which is one of the focuses today. Um, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for the presentation, Pravan. And if I could follow on from what uh, Mr. President has said, I think what I would have done differently is to realize much earlier that the Ministry of Finance is very crucial in, 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 this, in the topic of climate change. And it's something I came to about halfway through my tenure. Because uh, in Uganda, where it's not just the Ministry of Finance, it's the Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. And this is the only ministry that could bring the line, what we call the sector ministries, together out of their silo mentality. Because in our case, it was, we had the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, animal Industries and Forestry. Then there's a Ministry of Water and Environment. There's a Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. And the Ministry of Local Government, which was, re which was responsible for sensitizing and mobilizing the local farmers into one coherent um, voice. And the way we did this was to put it to them in, under the, the framework of sustainable and inclusive development. That if it's not sustainable, it's not inclusive. And if it's not inclusive, it's not sustainable. Um, I think being a technical person, I was selected as minister, I wasn't elected. Being a technical person, I could see the problem the politicians have. It's much easier politically to allow uh, population pressures to, uh, to, to, to let people go into farm, into forest land or into uh, forest reserves. It's much harder to tell them, no, don't go into the forest reserves. You have to stay on the land where you are and we're going to work with you and help you increase your productivity. Because that is more long term and it's very difficult for politicians. But on the, and as far as the long term is, is, com is, uh, is uh, concerned, how do you persuade the local people that it's for their own good? And I did this by not talking about climate change. Uh, we talked about soil erosion. We talked about women walking further to get clean water. We talked about the animals not getting as much fodder from the same acreage. We talked about reducing yields of, of crops. And that way, slowly, people began to open up to say, okay, what have you got to suggest to us? And then I had them to go back into the, the hat, wearing the hat of Minister of Finance with the international uh, partners, who were all very well intentioned, but again, to put them into a, into a holistic approach. And so we can't just talk about afforestation. We have to talk about what will it do to the incomes of the local people. Rather than uh, persuading them to lease or to sell their land to commercial plantations, encourage the commercial plantation owners to lease land from the locals 
let the locals stay on the land to look after the commercial forests. And that way they'll get buy-in, they'll protect the forests, and they'll get an income from the forests. Eviction of encroachers. We had to make sure it was not just the forest rangers going in and you know pushing people out of the forests. You had to have somewhere to push them to. To where? Again, the local government, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Energy, would have to bring all these people together. And each one would say, I am more important. We need to plant more forests. We need to mobilize the people. We need to, even the Ministry of Trade, okay, that if you increase productivity, you have to look at in, uh, helping them uh, improve their trade links outside the country. As, if, as far as the fiscal, actual fiscal uh, 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 area is concerned, I think Uganda has done most of what it could. We do not subsidize fossil fuels at all. It's the market prices. And somehow the market prices are always similar to the surrounding countries where the, the governments do fix uh, <laughs> fuel prices. On the other hand, we don't subsidize fertilizers either or ag other agriculture inputs, maybe a little bit towards elections, but as a, as a, as a general rule, no. We are very strong on improving our hydro, our hydro base. We're fortunate in having a lot of hydro potential. We're very, we are very strong on that. We put it as a core in our project analysis. So why aren't we yet the environmental utopia? It's because having laid the ground, we need to now make sure we go forward in a real, focused, coherent manner to be real in what can we achieve in the next five years or 10 years. When we look at solar, should we ask, should we accept international partners who want to, who, who want to uh, uh, finance solar initiatives, or should we ask them to finance agricultural productivity to improve, to uh, get, us, uh, get our improved seeds into the, into the ground and onto the farms? Skilling. We have a high population growth. We need to get more people off the land in order to reduce the pressure on the land. So do we ask some partners to help us in skilling to get people to be electricians and plumbers and whatnot so that they move off the land and reduce the pressure and that way free up more land to uh, increase productivity? The multinational companies. We have a resource uh, potential, we've got, we discovered oil. We've not yet signed any contracts to start pumping. We've got the production contract signed, but not yet pumping. But you got the multinational oil companies in this case, but they could be any multinational, who have a lot of experience and have a lot of legal expertise at their disposal. The governments do not. Do we ask the international partners to help us beef up in contract negotiation skills or help us uh, hire uh, top flight international lawyers when we're negotiating contracts. Because when you talk about multinationals uh, exploiting natural resources in Africa, it's all legal. It's all under one contract or another. So you have to go back to the contracts and say, how are these contracts formulated? And when we talk about encouraging private sector finance, which we have to do because that's where the money is these days, we need to make sure that there's a level playing field and that we have a conducive business environment. We need to focus on what areas, when it comes to emissions, what areas are most important. In Uganda, it would be uh, fossil fuels subsidies, which we do not have, open fires, of which we have a lot. Maybe that's where we should focus on getting improved cooking uh, methods by, uh, by subsidizing mini hydro, for instance, by uh, bringing in a lot of improved stoves. But as Pavan says, we need to quantify what is the benefit of that compared to the cost. And it all goes back to agricultural productivity. In Uganda, as in the rest of Africa, about 70 to 80% of our people live off the land. So you need to go into the agricultural productivity to make sure you have food security, but with less people working on the farm, who then you then have to find 
uh, skilling opportunities so they can to make uh, a living. I'll, I'll stop there for the time being. I could go more into the purely fiscal tools that are available, but I think we'll the most important thing was to show that it has to be a holistic effort across government, across regional governments, and across the continent. Thank you. <laughs> well, Maria, at the end, you put it very succinctly. We have to go into the heart of the agricultural economy if we want to affect that. And um, I will turn to Braulio now, and also then, please, as uh, our colleagues in the audience, um, I'll turn to you if you have any questions, comments, observations. We'll do a quick round and come back for a second round here. Braulio, um, Carlos Kling could not be with us this morning due to a family emergency, so I have to ask you to be both CBD uh, executive secretary, but also uh, Brazilian uh, guru and explainer, <laughs> which you can do very easily. Perhaps the reason I'm asking is the forest code became the hottest piece of legislation in the Brazilian Congress for a better part of two years, for the government, for the legislators, for the environmental community. It's two years almost now, isn't it, since the Forest Code has been implemented? 2012. Yes. 2012, so almost three years, yeah. Uh, a couple of reflections, because it is a classic instance of a government, the executive, battling with the legislative, with the same phenomenon that you spoke about, um, as in Calderon, of a very strong rural constituency. And at the same time, the implementation of the Forest Code happening very differently to what all the scenarios beforehand anticipated from either side. And then perhaps a second remark on, in a global setting, <coughs> looking at land use, agriculture, economy, deforestation, where are you seeing some of the most profound shifts coming through public policy in relation also to the CBD and the IHE targets? So over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Akin. So, um, I'll use uh, a little of my time just to talk a uh, 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 little bit about uh, uh, economic instruments related to uh, agriculture and, and, and biodiversity. And then I'll go to, to some examples uh, from Brazil. So the CBD, as you know, the current strategic plan has 20 global targets known as the Aichi targets. So there's a target to push for sustainability in the production sectors. So agriculture is the, the main one. That's target seven. There's a target number five to reduce deforestation and other conver conversion of other uh, uh, natural ecosystems to intensive use. There's also a target uh, uh, 14 to uh, ensure the maintenance of ecosystem services, especially those related to water, water and health. Also target 15 to push for restoration of degraded land. So there's a whole range of uh, 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 of uh, targets that uh, relate to agriculture. Agriculture will be one of the main I issues in our agenda for the next COP in Mexico in a year's time, uh, next December. And uh, we'll be discussing different approaches to further mainstream biodiversity in the agriculture sector. And certainly the issue of the public policies on agriculture and uh, its economic instruments and subsidies is a key one. Uh, I'd like to point out that the last COP in Korea uh, uh, a year ago, we adopted a decision on resource mobilization that includes a whole section on implementation of IET Target 3 on the reform of, of uh, economic instruments. And the parties agreed on a timetable for milestones to be reached. So uh, uh, initially to study existing economic instruments and subsidies to uh, identify those that have perverse impact on, on, on biodiversity. And by uh, next year, uh, uh, wherever those studies are already available, the parties have committed to start uh, implementing changes in these policies, either to reform these uh, uh, economic instruments, to phase them out, or to uh, 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 stop them. Uh, and then there's some further uh, 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 commitments uh, along the way so that we could really achieve uh, good results by the end of the decade. So uh, we hope that at the global level we'll uh, be pushing for this. Uh, there's a number of countries uh, that are uh, really uh, indicating some good uh, uh, efforts related to uh, pushing for agricultural sustainability. Uh, I'm very glad to work together with FAO who uh, have issued more recently uh, a number of very positive new 
uh, uh, policy uh, uh, documents uh, towards sustainability in the production sector. Uh, but let me give uh, some examples, some insights uh, uh, in the case of Brazil. So let me start with the forest code. So the forest code is one of the main policy instruments for land use in Brazil. And uh, it's uh, uh, linked with the understanding from the Brazilian constitution that uh, only recognize private rural property to the extent that they fulfill their social function. And the constitution uh, goes further to uh, identify that the social function of uh, private rural properties includes protection of the environment, uh, uh, sus uh, uh, sustainable use of natural resources, and uh, 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 the fair treatment of employees. Based on that, Brazil has a forestry code that uh, uh, has a number of environmental requirements. So uh, uh, land users uh, uh, and land owners are uh, obliged to protect uh, 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 forests and other ecosystems along the rivers, along high slopes, uh, in catchment areas, and high mountains. And uh, on top of that, uh, also to maintain a certain percentage of their property under uh, sustainable forest management with native forest. Uh, so uh, what Akin, uh, Akin referred to was the reform that uh, Brazil did in its uh, forest code in 2012, actually after almost a decade of debates and, and fights. And the end result was that all sectors ended unhappy with the results, which I think was a good thing. So both the, the farmers and the environmentalists were unhappy with the results. So it showed us that the, we got a balanced uh, result. And, and I guess Brazil has more uh, 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 senators and, and dep uh, deputies coming from the rural sector in our national uh, Congress than uh, uh, perhaps Mexico. So it was a very difficult uh, uh, battle. But the, the result, uh, I think, was, was great. Uh, uh, most of the, the fight was about how to deal with land that were converted in the past, uh, not in alignment with the forest code with the existing forest code. So, and fortunately, not in, uh, a big pressure to change the rules for future conversions. So we uh, managed to maintain, to keep all, uh, all the, uh, the good environmental requirements uh, uh, for future conversions. And uh, which includes, for example, uh, that if you own a piece of land in, uh, in the Amazon, you can only convert up to 20%. 80% has to be kept as forest. You are allowed to, to use it in a sustainable way, but as forest. So no clear cut is authorized, and you, 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 you have to uh, uh, use it sustainably. The interesting thing was that this new law established an, uh, 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 an obligation for all land uh, owners and users to register the information about land use and how they are coping with environmental requirements of the forest code in a new national rural environmental registry. So that is uh, uh, based on, on GIS data. And uh, now uh, already more than 60% of all the land under private property in Brazil are already inserted in the system. And the, what uh, an important measure that the, the new forest code uh, uh, provided is that starting a, in a year's time, no farmer uh, that has not uh, complied with this obligation to register uh, their uh, land use and to uh, 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 comply with the environmental requirements will have access to uh, public funding for, for agriculture. So that was a very radical uh, uh, move and of course uh, farmers are very uh, keen now to comply with this uh, legislation because if they don't they will lose access to, to funding. I also want to uh, refer that there are a number of other measures. For example, there's a, a national program for a low carbon agriculture with uh, a, a low interest rate uh, funding available for farmers uh, to uh, utilize a number of uh, uh, technologies available. Uh, Brazil has a strong uh, family agriculture com component in agriculture. And it took uh, President Lula, when he took into office in 2003, to create a second 
agriculture ministry to really pay more attention to family agriculture in Brazil. So in fact, Brazil has two agriculture ministries, the traditional one for the big farmers and this uh, uh, additional one which just dedicated to family agriculture. And thanks to that, there has been tremendous progress in Brazil in support to small uh, scale agriculture uh, throughout Brazil. Uh, there has been a, a moratorium on soya and beef produced in recently deforested area in, in Brazil. So both the finance, uh, the finance uh, sector, the, uh, 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 the public prosecutor's office and the Minister of Environment all uh, uh, monitor this so that uh, uh, all the, the big companies that deal with grain, with the meat, uh, uh, make sure that they uh, do not commercialize any product coming from recently uh, deforest areas. Uh, there is also um, uh, now in the INDC uh, proposal that Brazil submitted, uh, there is an increased uh, commitment of, towards uh, to reduce further deforestation, to uh, remove all illegal deforestation in Brazil. Uh, and just uh, uh, mention one of the uh, uh, policy instruments which has been utilized, the Minister of Environment, uh, uh, through regular uh, remote sensing monitoring of deforestation in Brazil, on a regular basis uh, ranks the municipalities in Brazil in terms of the uh, rate of deforestation. And so those municipalities on the top of the, the, the rank, they, uh, there's a partnership between the Minister of Environment and the Brazilian Central Bank. So access to funding is immediately cut to those municipalities that are on the top rank of the uh, uh, deforestation. So you can imagine that the next day they're put in this blacklist that they start knocking the door of the government, especially the Minister of Environment, for help on how to get out of of the blacklist. So it, it, all these policies work, but uh, there are also positive policies, uh, for example, agro-climatic uh, zoning, uh, working with, uh, uh, with the banks that finance agriculture in Brazil. So they have, uh, do, uh, they have done modeling to show how to reduce the risk of crop failure due to uh, 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 short uh, uh, drought uh, spells during the, the summertime, which we call veranicus. And so uh, uh, there, there is uh, guidance, uh, depending where you are and what crop you're planting, when it makes sense to plant an early flowering crop or a late flowering crop. And the banks have uh, started utilizing this on a voluntary basis because they discovered that, they, that re uh, the, if the farmers that are taking loans utilize those advice, the risk of not paying back the loans reduces. So then uh, the insurance cost goes down and the banks can offer a loan with a, a lower interest rate. So it makes, it's a win-win solution. Raleo, <coughs> we could go on, but I, I want to turn to the audience for a moment. But I think one very particularly important aspect of this is that when we talk about broader fiscal policy, it's not only legislative taxation policy. It starts reaching to something that, Maria, you have been part of the Inquiry Advisory Council, uh, looking at the essentially the role of central banks and of financial regulatory authorities. And we've just heard some very interesting examples of the interface between an agricultural economy and the financial economy as regulated or incentivized by an authority or the development bank uh, in Brazil. And I think this is where we begin to start talking about the, the broader arena within which a farmer, a land user or a foresting, uh, forestry industry is beginning to get signals that are different and we start talking about scale. Let me turn for a moment to you. I don't know if there is anybody who would have a question or a comment or a response. So I will pick one, two, three, four, five, and then uh, do another round. Can you be um, as pointed and as brief as possible? So one, two, three, four, five here in the front. Yeah. I've seen you in the next one, Ken. Please. And please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Julia from South Pole Group. Right now, we are developing uh, sustainable livestock NAMA in Colombia. And Colombia right now is supporting this type of mitigation action. So my question is, for example, for Mexico, do you think like NAMA could be an incentive or a solution to uh, stimulate sustainable economic growth in the agriculture sector or, or not? <laughs> Thank you. 
Can I collect the questions? And uh, the gentleman at the back, I think it was. Uh, maybe um, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Perfect. Let's take it here and then to the back. <coughs> Excuse me. No, Alain Carcenti from CIRAD uh, in France. Uh, it's a question more for Pavan Sukhdev about uh, the discussion between subsidies and taxes. You make uh, a right point that there is uh, very little room to increase taxes uh, at, the uh, at the time being, uh, and it would be a, a more sound policy to try to, to remove and to decrease, decrease subsidies and so, so etc. The difficulty I see is more a theoretical and practical one. Uh, is that, uh, in fact, if you remove some subsidies, you do not make any money available for, uh, for instance, for conservation or for, for ecosystem services because the Ministry of Finance will simply have more money. It's, 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 just, it's just the money that will not be created or will not be, uh, 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 will not be available. And I think the, uh, maybe uh, it, it more be in, into another equilibrium, but maybe we can have, uh, for instance, in, uh, in Mexico, I've been told that the PES program is, is, uh, is funded by, uh, by a small tax on water. And uh, in Costa Rica, it's based on a, a tax on water and fuel. So I think the idea would be if you, if you remove subsidy, it's great. And absolutely, in, in, a, in a general equilibrium, I think it's, it's absolutely right. But you know, do not create any money available for uh, paying for conservation. So I think there is still room for low taxes on a very large basis uh, to see. I think uh, you have some example in Costa Rica and Latin America. And I think I would, would like you to, to have some elaboration on this. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman in the latter part of the room. Hi, thanks. I'm Will McFarlane from the ODI. And we're also a partner in the new climate economy, which President Calderon uh, chairs. Um, ODI and NCE have worked on fossil fuel subsidies, fiscal policies, regulations, and also on subsidies and fiscal policies in agriculture that we think incentivize unsustainable land use practices. But I guess my opinion is there seem to be fewer high profile calls and a lot less volume from campaigning organizations um, for reforming and using agricultural policies, regulations, you know, fiscal policy subsidies to incentivize better development outcomes compared to the volume uh, that there is around fossil fuel subsidies. And I wanted to ask the panel if they agree, and if so, why they think that is. Thank you, and maybe I could also ask the panel and others to reflect on, I mean, we are also in France, we are also in Europe, where a very small number of agricultural producers have taken a very significant share of the entire collective finance of this European Union over decades. So it may be an interesting reflection also, what is the capacity of agriculture to put what is, at least in economic proportion, a totally distorted um, proportion of finance uh, into that sector. I mean, there are reasons we have to understand. It is, again, the, the losers who have obviously strong arguments, at least in principle. Um, I had a hand over there. You know which one, who you, were you? Uh, yeah, there, just. Uh okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Yunus Yumte from Samdan Institute in Indonesia. I have two questions. One is for Mr. Pavan Sudev. Uh, one of the, the direct implications of incentivize the agriculture is in the expanding of the destruction of primary forests. And the, in the particularly the developing country with large uh, primary forest still intact in the place like my, uh, the place where we are working. Uh, my question is, what is your opinion and what is your suggestion that, that each developing country should take to make sure that this policy and this incentive to the agriculture is not make a bad implication to the, the current primary forest. In fact, that, that land and forest governance is right now and still, still weak in the developing country. And that's the first question to Mr. Pavan Zutev. The second question is to um, Madam Maria from Uganda. I remember one publication, one nice book wrote by Fred Pierce, the UK-based uh, writer. He, he wrote about the global theft of land and human rights, the implication to human rights, disposition and destruction. And this, he described how incentive, how the incentive they provide by the, the government to, to make sure that the agriculture is going 
it's much more benefit the big company. It's not net, not make benefit directly to local people. How do you see and to make sure that this uh, this fact it's not happen in your country? To make sure that the benefit or the, the the incentive that you provide or the policy that you are create to make sure the agriculture it keeps expanding or to make sure the land use are being using in the more wise way is provide a benefit to local actor is not provide the benefit to those people who have more money out there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And um, I think particularly this point of foreign investors, I mean, very often it is the local communities who actually are net net losers. Not only do they lose access to land and resources, they also don't gain the benefits from that different use. I mean, we have many instances right up to the extremes of land grabbing, which are becoming more prominent on our radar. Um, the gentleman here on the front. Um, do you want to take my microphone? Um, Patrick Holden, uh, Sustainable Food Trust, um, modestly subsidized European farmer. Uh, I can give the amount. Um, and also um, a steering committee and advisory board member of TBAF, the initiative that's being launched later today. Um, the study lead of TBAF, Alexander Muller, was one of the architects of the feed-in tariffs, which transformed the uh, business case for small-scale renewable energy production in Europe. Um, I, my question is partly to Pavan, but perhaps for all of you. What is the agricultural equivalent of the feed-in tariff, because at the moment there is not a good business case for farming in a truly sustainable way, for instance, in relation to soil carbon. And it seems to me until we, we come up with uh, that intervention, we are going to stay with things as they are. What a, what a nice question to um, put back to the panel in a moment. Um, let me just take one more, which was here, because I think we may not get another round, so I'll take another one, two, three, <laughs> four <laughs> questions, and then give the panel a bit more expansive time to answer. Please. Uh, thanks, Akim. Uh, Joydeep Gupta, I'm a journalist from the Third Pole. Uh, Pawan, my question to you is that I haven't heard enough from either you or the panel today about the effects of subsidizing water and hydropower on smallholder farmers. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, right there at the back. Thank you, Sony Mumbunan, University of Indonesia. Uh, I think the issues of fiscal policies tend to be in this discussion on subsidies. Uh, I would love to hear about fiscal transfers. Um, especially the case in, say, in, in Brazil with ICM as uh, Ecologico. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's relevant because of the decentralized and, and multi-layer structure of government and uh, transfers become also important part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go to the front, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Carolina Navarrete, and I work at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture here in Colombia. Um, my question is in reference to institutional design uh, to reduce deforestation, and specifically in the Amazon. Uh, there were some interesting examples about what is being done in Brazil uh, to effectively uh, reduce deforestation. And of course, there are in place many things like the remote sensing uh, that you mentioned. But the reality in many other countries in, in Latin America, it's, it's, it's quite different. And I'm doing my doctoral research in the Peruvian Amazon. And my question is in reference uh, more to how to uh, reduce, uh, in some way, make more effective institutions in the sense that, uh, let's say, in Ucayali, in the Peruvian Amazon, there is a new forest law. There are some institutions, but still 80% of the timber being extracted there is illegal. So it's not only a, a fact of reducing deforestation, but how to make institutions more effective in terms of reducing the illegal use of resources that is also leading to degradation and other problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, obviously borne out by experience in many parts of the world, I mean, including in Indonesia, where a few years ago, 80, <coughs> 70, 80% 80 of all logging 
uh, exported was actually legally exported. And uh, again, the best forest policies without the right institutional setting are theory. Uh, there was a lady here, uh, oh. sorry, I'm going to go now because we're running out of time. I apologize to my dear colleague there, but um, you have to come here. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Daphne Yin from Yale University, and I'm curious, uh, you know, there, there are these approaches to reduce perverse incentives or support, uh, use su subsidies to support better practices, but can you talk a little bit about the monitoring frameworks and the performance-based indicators used? I think sometimes the uh, indicators or monitoring is, are rather poor, and so trying to understand any strategies that the countries represented here have um, and to what extent they align with some of the existing monitoring systems out there for third-party uh, type certifications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of being able to answer some of these questions more substantively, let me now perhaps turn to Maria uh, and begin with you. And as you can see, colleagues, we have a very professional audience here with some very profound <laughs> questions. But that's the fun part of being here. So, Maria, um, on the specific question to you, but also on any other aspects, um, please feel free. Uh, I would ask you all to perhaps in about three to four minutes be able to give some feedback at least to the questions. Maria. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just flip through very quickly the issues where I thought I could contribute. One was, first of all, was on earmarking of water. One of the things I did when I was minister was to reintroduce VAT on piped water. And before you all scream with shock, Parliament wanted my guts for garters. They said, this is what you get when you bring a businesswoman into the government. How dare she put uh, a levy on water? Water is a universal right. But when I explained to them with facts and figures that VAT on piped water did not include the protected springs, the boreholes, or even some of the uh, uh, public standpipes. They began to listen. When I showed them that VAT was applying to the breweries, to the soft drink companies, the big hotels, the people with swimming pools, they said, oh, okay. And when I showed them that the standpipes, uh, the tax component was only 5% of the profit, and the other 95%, the standpipe owners were telling the people that, oh, this is a government levy. And so in the end, we agreed that all the money collected, the VAT collected on piped water would go to expand the piped water system in the rural areas. Uh, as for share, as for uh, water for irrigation, I'm almost embarrassed to say that Uganda is fortunate in having two rainfall seasons a year. So we rely mostly on rain-fed uh, agriculture. But yes, it's very important to see how to bring in irrigation as, 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 as a productivity tool. The next question was on how to incentivize forestry. Again, to make it into a business. And by making it into a business, then you can afford then to police it or to monitor it and to stop the illegal uh, lumbering. One of the big takeaways I've already got from here was the second ministry for smallholder farmers. I'm going to very much recommend that to our government because uh, it's true that agriculture is an emotive issue, but then it's also a big business issue. So I think if we can separate the two in Uganda, it's mostly emotive. Land belongs to the people. It's the second tenant in our constitution. So by belonging to the people, the government's hands are tied when it comes to uh, ignorant peasants selling their land for a pittance. So what we tried to do, what I tried to do was to encourage them to lease it out and not to, to sell it. But land belongs to the people and that has led to a lot of, um, on one hand, the good thing, but on the other hand, it's, it means you have to sensitize the landowners when, when it comes to dealing with the big corporations. And I then go back again to the question of assistance for contracts. Uh, I think all I can then f uh, finish up with is that this must be a partnership between the international community and the developing world. For the international community, they have to be reliable in, 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 um, in meeting their pledges and uh, in bringing that income stream, but then the governments must be reliable in g putting up a framework for the holistic uh, employment of these funds. We need to put more emphasis on adaptation, which means making 
the people see there's something in it for them, even in the short term. And to be focused, when we talk about emission control, what in each country, what can you do to make the most impact on emission control? I still say that for countries like Uganda, it's on making sure that fossil fuels are properly priced and helping to reduce uh, the impact of, of firewood on, on deforestation. Thank you. Well, they're very good questions indeed. So I will try to go quickly through several of them. One is where to start. Uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies and basically a lot of fossil fuels for agricultural purposes which are creating incredible uh, biases and deviation and, and bad, they are bad incentives. Of course, in, increases a lot the revenue for the government and the government could allocate in a better way to do that. Where to put that money? And um, probably we can go for some of your questions. One is uh, building institutional capacity for governments, which is a question you are saying. And actually, I believe that the main problem that a lot of developing and in particular Latin American countries have is the lack of rule of law and the lack of institutional capacity. We have natural resources where the largest producer of, of silver, for instance, the second largest for gold, oil producer, natural resources, 10,000 kilometers of beaches, blah, 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 blah. If we have not rule of law, we are unable to enforce the law in forest, but in any other field, it's gonna be impossible to get real development. So one, place to put the money, the money coming from the old subsidies is increasing institutional capacity for enforcing, which is crucial for forests, but enforcing is not enough. You need to create the alternative for economic uh, solutions for the people. A second place to put uh, the money is investing in the people themselves, which is education and health services. It, it doesn't imply that you're removing fossil fuels for subsidies, or subsidies for fossil fuels in agricultural. It doesn't imply that you remove money from, from the field. But the point, instead of putting the money in the uh, uh, side so or whatever, you put the money in the people, in the children, and the clinics, and the doctors, and the nurses, and you will increase the quality of life of those people. Third, it's investing in capital. It's quite important to invest in infrastructure in the rural areas, either roads or small dams for mini hydro or th things like that. Restoration of the soil, which is quite important. You can increase the productivity of the agricultural sector, and at the same time, you can reduce carbon emission, but restoring the soil, which is a very important issue. We didn't talk so much about that. Other points, you talk about monitoring. We have a very poor system so far, yes, but those systems are improving. Uh, by tradition, for instance, we need to wait five years in order to, to know the estimation of FAO about deforestation around. And now we have quite important systems. And the WRI was created, the, the Forest Watch, uh, Global Forest Watch, which is important, <coughs> with all the data available coming from satellite systems, specifically in the United States in the, I don't know, two, three decades ahead uh, and backwards. It's, it, it's a very powerful platform. The French government, for instance, and the German government, they have quite important system for monitoring surfaces. And um, with a, I don't know, it's the peaks in, this, in, the, in the photos, they are even more detailed after day after day. By the way, the French government is, is, is you need to pay them for the information. Maybe a good will uh, signal this coming from this cup is the, the French government could release by free all that information for any country or institution could be important. No, I don't remember the name, but it's important. We invested in that and we created some platform for satellites, satellite bases in Mexico, and we are able to, to monitor the surface in a better way. So we just think like that. NAMAS and other programs related with uh, the surface. We, we, we need to think finally in two kinds of ways in which we can increase the forest surface. One is, by preventing deforestation, increasing the quality of life of indigenous communities living there, which is quite important. In poorest countries, the people lock down the forest because they have no economic alternatives. They need to eat on a daily basis. We need to provide them the economic alternative, either paying them the environmental services. We started in Mexico 
uh, only in the water basins. And then we extend that not only for those goods that provide water, but also they provide in oxygen and, and uh, um, carbon sequestration, to say. So we are paying with tax money. And of course, in order to avoid that Secretary of Treasury take the money away from subsidies to put in somewhere else, you need to be to have very strong and to have this enough political will to do that. Finally, we need to think in an economic viable solution. And I think a forest industry could be one. Again, poorest countries are unable to find us long-term solutions. And forest industry is related with long-term. Probably, I don't know, palm oil, not deforestating, but in, in other, in restoration soil already deforestated, uh, could pay back in three, four years. Uh, Christmas trees, for instance, could pay back in six, seven years. And more complicated uh, the timber could, be, could pay back in 12, 15, and 20 years. But payback, it's viable, it's profitable. What we need to do is allocate the financing procedures and the personal human capacity to do that. But there are people, especially indigenous communities, they have not time to wait, time to expand, no? waiting 15 or 12 years, they need to, to eat on a daily basis. That's the problem we have. If we are able to overcome the lack of financing for those communities, we will solve a lot of the problems we have. Thank you very much, um, President Calderon. Um, Braulio, maybe a, a slight curveball question on top of that. Um, when we look at subsidies and the distortions, we also have a very specific example. Brazil, Indonesia, $40 billion in terms of domestic subsidies go into the economy every year. The transfer payments that RED, reducing emissions from deforestation, has yielded so far is in the range of, I don't know, $350 million. So essentially 100 times more domestic money is spent on the opposite of what international financing has been leveraged to try and help governments to reverse. Maybe the number or the ratio is not the most important, but is that international finance helping to address those 40 billion, or is it just throwing it into the wind? I think we need to be more strategic in terms of use of international financial flows, uh, not to sub uh, substitute uh, actions that can be done uh, uh, at national level through other means. Um, and, and one of the uh, perhaps mo mo most interesting use of that international flow is to look at the finance uh, within each country and to uh, examine opportunities to introduce change in public policies, fiscal policies and otherwise. And there are, there's a range of experiences out there. UNDP, for example, with the Biodiversity Finance Initiative has been providing customized uh, 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 support to countries to do that. UNEP uh, w with uh, the, uh, the initiative on finance also. So there are uh, opportunities. Um, for example, uh, it, it's not just about uh, 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 when we talk about fiscal policies to create uh, new taxes. Uh, it's important in terms of the example given by U uh, Uganda in terms of water. Brazil also when uh, we uh, uh, updated our uh, water resources law in 95. That law uh, uh, recognized water as an economic good, and it allowed the government to tax water. And that money goes to all the river basin committees to conservation of uh, watersheds. So it's a, 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 an important source of uh, funding for, for conservation and, and restoration. Uh, let me give you a good example. Uh, the main tax in Brazil is collected by the states. It's the tax related to commerce. And uh, a significant part of that tax needs to be returned to each municipality. The old rule was to, uh, the allocation rule was only based on economic output. So those municipalities with stronger economy would receive more. So 25 years ago, Brazil started to change that. And uh, uh, that tax in Brazil is called ICMS. So uh, we started creating what we call an ICMS ecological. And uh, it's a simple thing. So uh, uh, legislation was introduced that a small percentage of the uh, of tax that needs to be returned to the municipality would now also be uh, made based not on economic output, but in terms of how much 
uh, forests or other ecosystems are protected in each municipality. And this has been transforming the whole field because then uh, uh, we start getting support from the mayors, from the administrations in each municipality. Uh, this system has been uh, um, upgraded, for example, using uh, monitoring. Uh, so if uh, some of the existing forests and other ecosystems are burned down or, or deforested, then the, uh, the municipality does not receive that allocation anymore. So there's a penalty. So, and, and this has been one of the uh, uh, effective ways. So uh, allocation of fiscal resources is a, a, a huge uh, area of potentials that uh, 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 most countries don't explore uh, uh, well that, that possibility. I, I fully agree that uh, uh, we need strong, in, in, capable uh, institutions. Just having good laws is not enough. In Latin America, all of countries have good laws but that's not sufficient. So we need strong institutions and strong instruments. So a country like Brazil, we only managed to make progress with uh, reduction of deforestation uh, because we have had good monitoring, so good data. In Brazil, since the mid-80s, mid we do wall-to-wall -wall monitoring of ecosystems, and initially on an yearly basis, then uh, on a monthly basis, so this is, and, and that information is open access. So this empowers society. So all the uh, NGOs and society in Brazil use that information to put pressure on governments and on, on private corporation. And the free press. So these are all important elements for these things uh, to, 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 to work. So uh, I think that uh, uh, the issue of uh, verification associated with monitoring is increasingly important. Of course, to implement Red Plus, we need good systems in place, right? Um, in terms of uh, 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 illegal uh, uh, logging, for example, the main problem has been that uh, most of the law enforcement is, is based on paperwork. So you have permits uh, on paper. But that can be, uh, can be easily falsified. So the government is always uh, developing new systems, but then the, 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 those that are engaged in Ill illegal commerce are always ahead of the game, producing, uh, copying the system. So I think we need to shift to some other uh, mechanisms. So for example, technology had uh, made uh, great progress in terms of identification of timber. So with DNA barcoding and some other methods that now are very cheap, and uh, for which we already have some good libraries of uh, documentation of uh, DNA sequences. So now it's a, a matter of uh, getting governments to really start using this in a, uh, on a regular basis in, in, in the uh, customs uh, offices and everywhere and trying to get this into the supply chain. So there's a potential to revolutionize the whole uh, area uh, by, by moving away from just uh, uh, paperwork uh, uh, but to actual uh, capacity to verify the, the uh, provenance of these uh, uh, timber. I'm sorry to cut you off, Braulio. Any other thoughts? I mean, there's thousands of examples. Maybe one last one, and then I have to turn to Pavan because <laughs> we are running out of time. No, no, no. Yeah. Let, let, let's move to Pavan. Yes, okay, please. thank you very much. But again, astonishing what a systematic approach you have laid out is evolving in Brazil already. And I think this is part of what we keep on discovering, I'm sure, but in Calderon, as you did your commission also, whenever we as UNEP go out and, and do these reports on tea or green economy or red, the innovation curve is shifting so rapidly southwards, uh, eastwards, westwards, and not necessarily northwards. And I think this is part of the interesting um, fiscal policy discussion about land use also. But Pavan, and uh, perhaps a small challenge to go back to um, Patrick's question, I mean, maybe at the end. Is there the equivalent of the feed-in tariff to begin to change the DNA of the agricultural economy? Over to you. Um, I'll try and answer. I've been going through some excellent questions. Thank you to the panel uh, and, sorry, to the members of the audience. I'm going to try and answer just five of them very quickly. The first one was about uh, your question on removing subsidies versus introducing taxes and introducing other incentives. You're right. It We do, in order to be able to support conservation better, we would need payments for ecosystem services and other such schemes. Costa Rica's is one great example. But the reason why I focus our attention on the subsidy challenge today is because my sense is, and I've been writing about this, that there is a significant 
fiscal problem waiting to happen in the G20, that we are testing our ability to manage our fiscal gaps, and unless we come out with better alternatives as to how to do so, uh, this will not only be an environmental problem, it will be a huge fiscal problem as well. So I like to point out that we really do need to address different ways of addressing the fiscal challenge and fiscal gap management. That's the only reason why I talk more about that. Uh, a question on uh, discussion, destruction of primary forests and what can developing countries do. Uh, my response to that would be that if we explore the re reason why this deforestation of primary forests is happening, typically the answer is maybe sometimes mining, but mostly it is either palm oil or beef or soya or one of the other uh, primary agri sectors or maybe in some case cash crops. And frankly, I would like people to recognize the role of the value chains of beef, palm and soya and how important it is to focus on those. So very often the actual destruction, Indonesia as a case in point, is taking place as a result of actions of smaller farmer. But firstly, the land that they generate once they clear it is ending up in the hands of the large companies. And secondly, the palm, the oil output they generate is being integrated into the value chain supply of the large companies. So unless we f create value chain traceability in these value chains in the developing countries, we are missing perhaps the key element of the solution towards a better managed system and therefore the ability to put in place fiscal incentives and taxes and, and penalties for that matter, not just taxes and, and subsidies. Um, the, the question was asked uh, by Joydeep on subsidizing water and what the role uh, and removing those subsidies has on smallholder farmers, but I think um, Madam uh, Kiwa, Kiwanaka has answered that um, eminently well, and I'll just add that it's a question of tiering and pricing. That there are certain kinds of water supply which one can remove that from, and then there's the basic demand which you need to meet, the basic human demand. Um, in response to Park Sony's question in the audience there on ecological fiscal transfers, you need to look no further than Brazil and India. Both countries have introduced, and Brazil for a much longer time, ecological fiscal transfers, and they seem to be having an effect from what reports I hear on India. In fact, the response is quite uh, agitated sometimes and therefore effective in that sense from the states who suffer as a result of their finance ministry applying these transfers. So I solidly recommend that this approach should be explored by all other, other countries. And finally, to the, the prize question, I think, of uh, Patrick, uh, from, from our technical advisory committee on what's the agricultural equivalent to the feed-in tariff? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a great question to which I will not suggest a, a clear answer, but I will suggest a direction to the answer, which is that I think the, the discourse today in agriculture is forgetting that more than half the food that's grown is grown by small farmers, and by that I mean the 475 million, according to the FAO, small farmers with less than two hectares at their command. And <coughs> that these small, these small farms are providing one billion jobs. There is not a single alternative in the world to the employment choices that is provided by small farms. The total number of people in the car industry is five, six million. In the IT industry, is six, seven million. Global numbers. What on earth are we going to do if we lose the small farmer? We can't. We have to look, in my opinion, in the direction of what package can be devised and has to be a diversity of packages based on the crops, the location, the geology, the ecology, and the region. A diversity of packages devised for the small farmer to do the only thing that's possible for the small farm, which is to make it a better small farm one which yields more at lower risk to the small farmer and therefore delivers the following solutions. Firstly, more incomes in the hand of the poor and, and three-fourths of the poor are actually in small farms. Secondly, delivers them more food, a solution therefore to hunger in the developing world food stress region. And finally, delivers them the integration that we need to make them part of the sustainable development around the world. So it will be in that direction, Patrick. I'm sorry to maybe not pinpoint it. Thank you, Pavan. No, I just sense that there is a room trying to come in, and there is a room trying to come out here. So we have to, we have to wrap up. Um, let me just say that I think this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I think it is showing that we are really beginning to bring the issue of environment, of economy, of social, of jobs, and of sustainability into a new conversation. I think we are seeing, after a better part of 50 years of environment looking at the agricultural sector as that big problem, increasingly also reframing some of those discussions in terms of solutions, including uh, the job dimension. Let me just suggest that um, I think as we look forward to the future of agriculture,
part of the answer to Patrick's point may also be to say, the minute we understand that farmers are not just food producers, but are actually managers of an ecological infrastructure that underpins our economies and therefore get compensated on that basis in whichever form, we begin to also change the economic system that is driving agriculture, including individual farmers, to the very brink of actually exploiting the resource to the point of no return. And I think this is why, interesting enough, environmental science and the ministries of environment, I want to end on that because we also have to look at what is the role of an environment ministry in the future vis-a-vis -vis the finance minister, the agriculture minister. It is to change the optics of an issue because then other actions become possible in the rest of the economy. And I think the fascinating work that TEAB is doing, I see Salman here also, the TEAB for agriculture and food is underway. Um, the green economy, the new climate economy, uh, the Global Green Growth Institute. This is part of changing the frame within which we begin to ask questions and then answer also in terms of solutions. One last remark, because institutions were brought up, absolutely critical. Again, nobody could really spell what a catastrophe office is before in Brazil really the work started on the forest code because the catastrophe office was the basis on which to even determine who has what land under what use. The environmental prosecutors that you have in Mexico are also a fascinating model. Specific prosecutors who go around the country looking for where is the law being broken in terms of environmental legislation. Institutions are part of the broader <coughs> policy, but the fiscal policy landscape is the one that sets the agenda in which then things happen. So with these remarks, thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you to our panel and have a very good forum. Thank you. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, you have to get... Oh, yes, they'll be in the... Yeah. Okay. They'll be in the... Uh, they'll be in the... Right. Right. Right.